Hi, I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. We have really cool topics today. Oh, we really do, Renee. And I'm glad to be back with everybody. We took last week off, so glad you all could join us this week. Um, we've got a really exciting show. We've got our resident entomologist, Dr. Jonathan Larson, is going to be talking about something really cool you see this time of year. And, um, you know, it's something you probably chased when you were a young child and maybe put in a jar and took it in your house. But um, who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll let Jonathan talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But we also have a, a new guest on the show. Um, Robert Bean. Robert is a service forester with the Kentucky Division of Forestry and uh, just a great all-around guy. And he's going to be talking about what a service forester does and within the Kentucky Division of Forestry. You know, Renee, that's one of the most important kind of forestry positions we have in the state because those are the uh, men and women that work one-on-one -on -one with woodland owners here in the state on trying to manage and care for their property. So really excited to have Robert on the show with us today. And then we have Dr. Ellen Crocker. She's got, they've been testing some new equipment out out. Um, maybe some new way to attack some of these invasive plants that we've got out there. Uh, so she's going to be giving us a, a report on a steam machine um, that can do some uh, the killing of some invasive plants. But we'll hear from Dr. Crocker a little bit more on that. But so glad you all could be with us today. If you're joining us via Zoom, please use the chat function and you can interact with us there. And if you're on Facebook Live, please use the comment section and we can interact with you as well. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. So uh, Jonathan, if you'd like to turn your camera on. Thank you for joining us today. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about fireflies with you here today. Uh, I love the opportunity to be on the show, so I appreciate that as well. And the chance to not talk about something that's a pest <laughs> and uh, how to kill it. So I appreciate Absolutely. you going to let me talk about something kind of beautiful and wonderful here. Uh, now we love having you on here, Jonathan. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to kind of unpack the splendor of fireflies and some of that mag the, the majesty that they produce every summer. I want to talk about their biology and I want to talk about uh, some of their anatomy and then also talk about some of the myths and folklore that surround them, as well as some efforts to conserve these jewels of the night. So to start with, I think the first thing that always pops up whenever uh, people start talking about fireflies is the name. Uh, many people refer to them as fireflies, uh, other people refer to them as lightning bugs. You can see that there are some distinct geographic differences in the usage of these terms. I will say both names are acceptable. Uh, firefly is the approved common name for the Entomological Society of America, but lightning bug obviously is very popular in states like Kentucky, where in both of these maps that you see here, it is this is solid lightning bug territory. So I, I was going to ask the panel, what do you call these glowing nighttime bugs? Yes, lightning bugs. bugs. <laughs> lightning bugs. Yeah, Those we grew up in Kentucky, so I guess yeah. we were indoctrinated from the get-go. So. True Kentuckians, you're using <laughs> the, right, the right lingo. Uh, firefly is very common out west, according to the data. And then you can see, uh, I think the one on the right is a little more nuanced. It shows states like my home state of Indiana. I grew up saying lightning bug, uh, but there are some areas where it's a little more interchangeable in Indiana and Illinois. But uh, the truth of the matter is that both common names are a bit of a misnomer. They are neither flies nor bugs. So when you say something like firefly or dragonfly, you may notice that that's all one word. And that's an indicator that you're not talking about a true fly species. If you were talking about a housefly or a horsefly, those two words will be separated uh, so that you know you're talking about a true fly species. Similarly with uh, bugs, these are not bugs, they're not part of hemiptera, things like bed bugs or plant bugs that are a part of that order. These are beetles. So fireflies are actually soft winged beetles. When you compare them to other beetles in the coleoptera, uh, they do have a different feel to them, uh, uh, interestingly. So if you look at the scarab there on the left, they have their elytra uh, on the top there. All beetles have four wings but one pair is hardened and toughened so that it can protect the membranous ones that are underneath. With the soft wing beetles like fireflies, it is a little more pliable, a little more leathery in feel, rather than kind of the hard plastic feel that you would see with a scarab or a lady beetle, things of that nature. Uh, so they are a part of this group, but they look a little different than the other beetles. They are most closely related to click beetles, which are famous for their ability to kind of flex the middle of their body, the part where the abdomen and thorax meet to produce a click. 
that can actually project them several inches up in the air. Uh, then they are also closely related to soldier beetles, which we see a representative of here in the middle. This is a goldenrod soldier beetle. Uh, this group is the one that I think looks the most like the, the lightning bugs or the fireflies. They have similar coloration, sort of a similar, similar membranous feel to them. And then we have the net wing beetles, which also sort of resemble fireflies, but they usually have kind of larger elytra. They're more light bulb shaped uh, in their appearance. Within all of this mixture, fireflies do have their own family that they're a part of. It's called Lampyridae, which is a very clever uh, family name. I think it, it alludes to the fact that they glow. And then it has around 2,000 species uh, that are inside of that family across the globe. So it is a pretty diverse group of beetles. And they glow in a lot of different ways. Some have green glows, some have orange glows, some are more blue. The ones that we are uh, familiar with here in Appalachia are that kind of lime green glow though. Like other beetles, these go through complete metamorphosis. They start their life as an egg. They then will hatch and there will be a larval form that will eventually pupate and become an adult. Any individual firefly that you may encounter here in Kentucky is probably about two years old if you're seeing them as an adult. They spend most of their time as a larva. They usually have two growing seasons that they can progress through. Uh, the amount of time that they spend as an egg, a pupa, and an adult probably accumulates to about two months total. The rest of that time, they're in that larval form. Their eggs are pretty interesting. They can be white or light yellow. Some species have kind of an orange color. They are orbish in shape, as you can see here. And uh, they are interesting because they can glow. Uh, fireflies are actually capable of producing that glow that they're famous for throughout their entire life. This doesn't mean that you're just going to go out into the woods and see tons of little sparkling orbs kind of hidden in cracks in the bark or in areas of leaf litter. They aren't glowing constantly, but there will be times where that light is emitted and you are able to notice them a little more. I couldn't get a lot of cool photos of that. This blurry one on the right is the only one that I could find that really demonstrated this possible glow that you see with the eggs. Once they hatch, they will become a larva. Most larva will uh, look like you see these two uh, in the images here. They are kind of plated in appearance. Some people refer to them as trilobite bugs because they have kind of a similar appearance to those fossilized arthropods. They usually have a long neck that terminates in their mouth, which has fangs on it that they will use to inject venom that paralyzes their favorite prey of worms, snails, and slugs. So they are voracious predators. They're generally in damp areas where their prey items live. They're common in swamps. We see them next to creeks, uh, anywhere with kind of a moist habitat. Uh, the larval form also glows. You can see that on, a right, on the right here, all firefly larvae are capable of glowing. It's a requirement to get into their club. And then again, the pupa, they also glow. You can see it's starting to, to look a little more like an adult firefly here. And the glow is kind of where you would expect it to be. Pupa are found in moss. They can be found in soil, on tree bark, beneath rocks. Sometimes they seem to pupate in groups and clusters. Uh, they usually are in this form for about one to three weeks, depending on the temperature. In Kentucky, they're most likely pupating in May. And then they will start emerging in June which is when we see things ramp up for fireflies as adults. Uh, they reach this adult stage and become those kind of black beetles with red and yellow markings so familiar to many of us. They don't typically eat as adults. They do go to milkweed plants and nectar, uh, but they are actually there to acquire chemical defenses from the milkweed plants, which they will then have inside their body and stored as a defensive compound that they can, if you've ever picked up a firefly, you may notice that they'll sometimes uh, exude a goo that gets on your hands and it smells kind of weird. If you ever lick it, it tastes kind of funky and it helps to repel things from eating them. Uh, I haven't tasted that. I have tasted ladybugs before, but I haven't tasted firefly goo, uh, but I, I have it on good authority. It doesn't taste very good. They are most famous for their glowing capabilities, this kind of bioluminescence that they produce. When we look at uh, nature, we do see that there's lots of things out there that glow. Some things like Ellen's favorite fungi uh, are able, capable of producing a glow. Sometimes they're doing this just for simple illumination. It helps them to see things better. Other species that glow use their light to attract prey items like we see with this deep sea fish. Some use the glow to warn their own predators away from them to try and say, hey, I taste bad. 
or they'll use it to defend themselves. It produces a startled response in the predator and they're able to escape. The fireflies glow in order to actually communicate within their own species. So they're talking to one another with their glowing butts. Male fireflies are the ones that are usually flying around in the air and they are producing sort of a Morse code like specific flash pattern that is transmitted to females that are in the grass in the trees and shrubs below who will then respond with their own flash pattern that says, hey, I'm down here and I'm interested. And then he will descend and they will do some more courtship and initiate mating. It's a very interesting process. We don't see a lot of visual communication with insects necessarily, but this is probably the most spectacular display of it. This is a time-lapse video from the South Farm, the horticulture farm with the University of Kentucky. We've been trying to take some video footage of fireflies here this summer. And so this is, I think, about 30 minutes of time distilled down into about 30 seconds. And you can see as it gets darker, the fireflies start to ramp up in appearance. All of these males that you see kind of going around in the air are talking to females that are in the grass below. I don't know if you noticed it, uh, about halfway through the video, a skunk appeared and started wandering through the area, which made it very exciting. But they'll go deep into the night. Some firefly species don't actually start talking until about midnight. They need the deepest, darkest period of time in the night. When you see these flashes, you can identify them and uh, differentiate between the flashes and then figure out what firefly is active in the area that you're looking at. So these are a few of the more common ones here in Kentucky. The most common one is the Big Dipper or Flying J firefly, Botinus pyralis, which creates this kind of lazy J shape and then will fly a little further and make it again. It's, it makes uh, this pattern that we are familiar with. Others make a series of dots. Some make uh, almost an SOS pattern where they go three quick flashes and then go a little further and make that again. Others are a continual glow with a pause. And then Photinus carolinus that you see on the bottom here, uh, they make this really fast beep, 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 beep. And then they go a little further and go beep, 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 beep. Uh, and it looks very rapid when it's going through the air and doing this. Uh, lots of people talk about this. I think this is incredibly difficult. The only easy one is Photinus pyralis with the flying J. Uh, the others I think are extremely difficult to differentiate in the moment. Uh, it's something that you can do. There's lots of charts and books about this. But uh, I think it's difficult when you get in the field to actually try and accomplish this. There's one species that's called the femme fatale, who uh, is, as a female in this species, they mimic the response flashes of a different genus of fireflies. When the male descends down to try and mate with her, though, he is eaten. Uh, she grabs him and gobbles him up. It is unclear exactly how this evolved, uh, but it is it has been discovered that the reason they do this isn't just because it's easy prey. Uh, these females, they never visit milkweed themselves, and instead they gather their chemical defenses from males that have been to flowers before uh, by eating them. So it's a very interesting kind of roundabout way of getting those chemicals that they need. The other question that pops up with these is how do they make that glow? How does their butt light up uh, like this? It's a pretty complex chemical process. I will try to simplify it as much as possible. Basically, there are two key ingredients that are called luciferin and luciferase. These biochemicals are combined in the lower abdomen, which is called the lantern. It's that kind of yellowy area on them when it's not turned on that will then glow. Uh, the luciferin and luciferase are combined with things like ATP and oxygen. And then when that happens, light is emitted. And it's an amazing process. It's one of the most efficient light production systems in the world. Uh, the chemical process that accomplishes this 90% of the energy that's used to make it happen is producing light. And then only 10% is wasted as heat. That's why when you hold a firefly, you don't get burned. If you compare that with our light bulbs that we build, 90% of the energy that goes into a light bulb is uh, wasted as heat. That's why it hurts to change a light bulb that has been turned on for a while. And only 10% of the energy actually produces light that we need uh, when we put that light bulb in. So lightning bugs are far more efficient at creating light than we are. I think fireflies are amazing. They're a beautiful insect. They captivate human imaginations. They inspire a lot of feelings of summer. I know when I talk to people about fireflies, uh, people have really deep childhood memories of them, of collecting them, putting them in jars. Many people consider them to be the bringers of summer. They start to appear near the summer solstice 
So they're often an indicator that summer is truly here. Some people talk to me about, they associate them with 4th of July because they're kind of a natural firework, quote unquote. And they are often kind of ramping up their appearances around then in states like uh, Indiana and Michigan and other places. They have been present in myths and, and, and folklore for a long time. They've represented souls in some nations where these are dying soldiers that are leaving the battlefield and kind of glowing up to heaven. Uh, some cultures view them as the bringers of fire. They've given the gift of fire to humanity. Others uh, have associated them with stars, with sort of earthborn stars. This is a woodcut uh, painting from Japan from 1891 showing people catching fireflies and putting them in a container. So we've been doing this for centuries. They appear in a lot of stories and poems and folk tales. Uh, there's a lot of native traditions with fireflies. Uh, there's cool poems like Ogden Nash's here. The fireflies flame is something for which science has no name. I can think of nothing eerier than flying around with an unidentified glow on a person's posterior. Uh, so they're, they're humorous, they're interesting, they've just long captivated our attention. And this has resulted in firefly tourism actually becoming a thing. In states like Tennessee and a lot of their state parks and natural areas, people will come from all over the country and all over the world to watch synchronous emergences of fireflies in these areas. There are tours, there are buses, uh, there are camping areas that are dedicated almost solely to having people come in in June and July to watch the fireflies. The other thing I get asked about with fireflies, just about every year, I have several people that want to know where they've gone. Uh, have they disappeared? Are they going extinct? The truth is, is that we don't know. Uh, anecdotally, it does seem like there are fewer fireflies now than there were in the past. This has a lot of complex variables to it, of course, but there's no concrete data on this. We don't have numbers about fireflies from the past that we can compare to now to really state with accuracy and factual uh, verification that there are fewer now than there used to be. I think that this is all sort of tied up in emotions as well, uh, because it seems like something from your childhood is less common. And it makes people quite sad. And I think that's why they ask this question a lot. It is true that they're under threat by lots of things. They're harmed by urbanization. We get rid of their habitat frequently. Light pollution is actually quite harmful to them. That video I showed from the horticulture research farm is right next to Walmart and a few other big lit up areas. And there's no fireflies over there, but they were all on the farm where it can get quite dark. Uh, people that leave on baseball stadium lights or have lots of exterior lighting, you will see fewer fireflies just because they can't communicate in that area. Our illumination reduces the ability for them to see each other's glow. And so they're just not gonna be able to live in that area. Uh, and light pollution continues to get worse and worse as this uh, heat map shows you on the right here and climate change can affect them. There's a book called Conserving the Jewels of the Night by the Xerxes Society, which outlines a lot of ways that we can help preserve them, uh, ways that you can change your yard and introduce firefly habitat. Uh, but just simple things like turning the lights off outside can also be very helpful. So I hope that you've all gone out and seen some of them this year. Uh, try and catch them, re remember your childhood and look at some of these glowing bugs. Uh, they're beautiful, they're weird. They're interesting, and uh, I hope that we take more steps to try and conserve them. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. You know, I was going to ask you the question, what makes a bug's butt light up? But <laughs> you already Luci answered that. Luciferin and luciferase, yeah. <laughs> Very interesting chemicals that are found just in these, these insects. Uh, we've tried to, we have synthesized it. Uh, you, If you ever bought a glow stick that you have to snap, yeah. There is there is a, a human made version of luciferin and luciferase in there. That's why it kind of resembles a firefly. But yeah, it's a it's a fascinating process to turn that that butt light bulb on. Yeah, uh, I was Jonathan. Yeah, as I was listening and watching your um, presentation, I was sitting there chuckling. You, you you do such a great job of educating in a very entertaining and engaging and approachable way. So um, yeah, yeah, that was cool. Very cool. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Definitely appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, that was cool. All right. You know, speaking of cool. Speaking of cool, you know, and the thing about it is we always say, what does a service forester do? And now I'm going to actually ask him, what does he not do? <laughs> we have Robert Bean on to talk about that. So, Robert, if you'd like to turn your camera on. All right. Morning. Good morning. 
Robert, it's so good to have you. You know, I've had the pleasure of working with you many times over the years, and you are so great with landowners and our woodland owners here in the state, and uh, just such a great representative of our service foresters here in Kentucky and all the great work that they do. So, um, as Renee said, we're so excited to hear a little bit about what service foresters do and maybe see if there's something you don't do, because <laughs> it is a big list. It really is. All right. All right. So... What you see on the screen is a picture of my office, um, at least about, about half the time. So everything we do out in the woods, we have to then come back and, and write up on a computer. So we're outside about half the time and inside about half the time. And we also spend a fair amount of time uh, driving. Uh, we're, we're covering some pretty big areas. So it's easily, I can spend two hours a day driving. Um, so the main thing that we do is work with private landowners and helping them manage their, their forest lands. So if it will move on, there we go. So the, the first step of that is to actually talk to the landowners. So often this is done at the, at the bed of a pickup truck rather than in, the, in a house like this. But we talk to the landowners, we want to find out what their interests are, what they're trying to accomplish with their woodlands, um, how they have their boundaries marked, are there, uh, you know, things of interest that they have questions on on the property, uh, just get a good feel for, for where they're coming from, what's, what's gone on on the land as far as they're aware, so we can get a kind of a feel for what we're, we're going to be looking for. So then when we go out in the field, hopefully we go out with the landowner. The, the visit on the property with the landowner in tow is, is much more valuable, I think, for the landowner than just us going out and looking at the property on our own, although we can do that. But when we go out, we kind of look for, we look for species mixes. We look for any sort of forest health issue. We measure the volumes of the trees. We... Um, we look for the regeneration to see what's coming back into the forest. Uh, we also look for invasive species. This picture is a clump of tree of heaven. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of the invasive species issues that we see around these days. And we look for special sites. So a spot like this could be a cultural special site or just a, a natural special site. And certainly we look for old home sites and cemeteries and that kind of stuff. So we're, we're kind of doing a broad investigation of the property, looking for things of interest and things of uh, importance there. And once we're done, we go back and we will then break up the property into management areas. So these areas are areas that have distinct vegetation types or will have the same sort of management recommendations on them. And for each area, we will write up a little write up that sit, tells what the major species are, you know, the, uh, the quality of the timber, uh, what the history of the stand is, any wildlife recommend or wildlife conditions, and then the most importantly, what the recommendations are to help the landowner meet their goals for, for that property. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a timber goal. So a landowner can be interested in wildlife or recreation, and still we can go out and talk to them about what they've got and, and let them know things they can do to, to help make a healthy forest. Once the plan is written, then we can help the landowner uh, actually try to accomplish some of the recommendations that we, we give. Um, in, in many cases, there's the possibility of getting some financial assistance, usually through the NRCS, to do some of these practices. There's some cost share programs available um, to, to help landowners do that. And we can kind of guide the landowner as to how to sign up for those programs. And there's lots of different things that might be involved in that we can help the landowner do. We can plant trees, um, do a timber stand improvement. Uh, timber stand improvement is a huge broad term. So in this case, I'm marking a crop tree release where we're finding the best trees and, and making sure that they have sunlight around so they can grow. 
Um, but we also do post-harvest work and uh, can do mid-story removal to try to encourage desirable regeneration prior to a harvest. So there's lots of different things that we can do is, that would fall under a timber stand improvement. But once, once we've marked the trees, then it's up to the landowner to actually treat them. And it may just be felling them, maybe herbicide treatments. There's a bunch of different things that, that may go into actually doing the actual treatment. We also can mark timber for sale. For a lot of people, the, the timber sale is the, the final process is what they're looking for is to see if they can get the resources off of their property. Now, that's not for everyone. There certainly are lots of benefits and resources that the forest provide that aren't timber. And it's certainly not necessary for people to, to uh, be managing for timber itself but we do want to try to make sure that the woods is, is healthy and has the potential of producing timber in the future if, if need be. So in, in once we, in addition to doing the plans and the stuff on the ground, we do education things. This is from an old field day. Um, prior to COVID, we did a fair number of field days. Now we don't do nearly as many, but we do get try to get out and educate the public um, we have put up displays and, and, and talked to people about uh, forestry and uh, hopefully get their interests. We do uh, school programs where we, we talk to the, the kids about, uh, about trees and forests. We do uh, tree giveaways. It's one of the things we work with the conservation districts in the spring to uh, give away tree seedlings. And normally what I'm there doing is talking to the landowners about the trees, species that the conservation district's giving away, how to plant them and care for them until they get them in the ground. We also work with the tree farm system and the stewardship forest. Um, that, so these are programs designed to recognize uh, people who are doing a good job of forest management and the tree farm system is now a certified uh, system so that the wood coming off of tree farms is certified. So these programs take quite a bit of our time to go back in every five years, these, pro these properties get looked at again um, to make sure that they're still following the, the practices like they're supposed to. We also uh, fight wildfire. So this is a picture we, we used to do a whole lot more aerial surveillance than we do now uh, where we'd fly in the airplane and look for fires. And that was one of my big tasks was doing that. We don't do that very much anymore. In, in central Kentucky where I work, um, everybody has a cell phone and a fire is not gonna burn very long before somebody's gonna report it. So we do, do firefighting um, in particularly parts of uh, the uh, state. This is a big part of what a service forester does in the spring and the fall, particularly in the east. Uh, normally, I have, in my area, I have like three fires a year. This spring was really busy. I had 10 fires this spring that I was involved in. And this is the main piece of equipment that we have to use for, for fighting fire. Um, Usually a forester isn't driving this, we're more leading the dozer to figure out the best place to put in a fire break or, or following behind to make sure the line's clean. We do a bunch of other things. So one of the things we do that I like is uh, we find and measure big trees. So if somebody thinks they have a state record tree, we'll go out and measure the tree um, and uh, submit it and maybe it'll be the the next record tree. We also every five years go back and look at the trees and unfortunately this is what we find sometimes. Those big trees are older and uh, can have problems. This was the state record swamp white oak that I looked at last week. We do uh, forest health visits for landowners so we'll look at the people sick trees and uh, try to let them know what if anything they can do. Uh, Realistically, there's not a whole lot that they can do. The biggest thing I can tell people in most cases is keep the lawnmower away from the base of the tree and the string eater. That's where most of the damage that I see that's preventable comes from is uh, people not doing their lawn maintenance very well. 
We also collect seeds for our nursery. So we usually have a seed quota that we have to do to try to pick up seeds so that our nursery can plant them and then grow them and sell them. And then we also have people that will, um, we that work at the nurseries to uh, get the seedlings ready for distribution. Um, the people that work around the nurseries tend to do that a lot more than, than we do out, out away from the nurseries. So all, all in all, we're, what we're trying to do is to uh, educate the public to help them manage our forest lands so that we can get all the benefits that the forests provide sustainably. So we wanna be able to have these forest lands be able to produce the, the timber, um, but also have the clean water, the air, the wildlife habitat and all that that the forests provide on a continuing basis. So that's a little bit about what a service forester does. Well, thank you for that. We greatly appreciate it. Like I said, what don't you do? <laughs> it seems like you have a lot of things that you uh, take care of. And so now there are certain counties that you handle, right? And then other foresters handle other counties? Right. Yeah. So I cover seven counties and uh, my area is really busy. So I, I have a pretty big backlog. So in my area, I am... Um, I'm about a year, year out seeing somebody new coming in. In other areas, they aren't nearly so bad. Some, mm -hmm. some places you may be able to be seen within a month or so. Um, but I usually can do about 40 plans a year and I've got 60 on my caseload at the moment. So, so it, it, it takes a while because, I mean, not only do you do the plans, you do the timber and TSI markings and you have to look at the practices and do tree farm. There's, so there's lots of different demands on our time. Um, and it generally depends on which region you are in as far as how long it may take to get somebody out to take a look at your property. Robert, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, we've got nearly 400,000 landowners, give or take, you know, <laughs> a few thousand here or there. Um, you know, woodlands cover almost half the state of Kentucky. They contribute over $13 billion to our economy. They employ more than 50,000 people. They're home to countless wildlife and other species. The woods and forests of Kentucky are important, right? And the work that you all do is vitally important. So, you know, I can't thank you enough and all of your, um, your counterparts across the state that are working one-on-one -on -one with woodland owners and trying to educate them and help them make good conservation decisions on their forests and woodlands. Yeah, that's what, that's what we try to do. And one of the things is, you know, there's 18 of us across the state. When I was hired, you know, almost 30 years ago, there were 42 of us. Mm. <laughs> so it makes a little bit of a difference in, in how quickly we can service a landowner. It, it does, you know, and, you know, typically a lot of times you're an extension, what you all are the first line of defense that we send landowners to, right? Um, you're out there to, to work with them. But as you mentioned, it can be some longer wait times depending on where you're at. And, and we'll mention to our viewers, there are a few other options as far as foresters in the state. Um, you know, we've got some that are now being hired for Natural Resources Conservation Service. Also got some groups like the Wild Turkey Federation, Rough Grouse Society, and others who are hiring foresters as well. So you're getting some reinforcements, Robert. Uh, maybe they're not service foresters like yourself, um, but we're trying to get some more foresters out there on the ground to help landowners wherever we can, you know. And I would encourage all of our viewers who are also voters, let your folks know that, you know, woods are important, right? They really are important and we need support for those woodlands out here in the state. Yeah, I mean, the consultants do a lot of uh, work out there and, uh, you know, that's, I, I have to refer a bunch of, particularly the timber harvesting stuff going on because people want to do that in a timely fashion. And I don't have the capacity to uh, mark something very quickly. So that's something that a lot of those kind of take cases have been passed to the consultant. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Our Kentucky Association Consultant Foresters, we got about 20 foresters or so in there as well. Um, you know, and that's another group, as Robert mentioned, that does a great job with the timber sale component, you know. But Robert, we need we need to do some management often before we get to that timber sale standpoint, yeah. you know. And um, I always tell landowners, you know, you need to kind of be planning in advance of that timber sale. You really do yeah. well in advance. Yeah, it makes a big difference. And it's, I mean, it's one of those things that 
this forest management work makes a big impact, but it often can be a long way down the road. You know, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to have landowners who are interested in trying to promote the forest and to, uh, you know, because they're likely not to see the final results of the work that they're doing. Um, you know, if you're doing a tree planting, you're looking at 80 to 130 years in the future for, for your harvest. And with timber stand improvement, it easily can be 60 years. Yeah. So, you know. You've got to have a long-term mentality, right? But this, you know. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, good stuff, Robert. Thank you, buddy. Really. You know, I really appreciate it. Yeah, really good. Uh, so All get right. to know your service forester folks out there, really, you know. All right, so steaming weeds. Yeah, so, you know, Dr. Crocker is always looking for ways to try to uh, combat these invasive plants that are threatening our forests and woodlands in the state. And uh, you've been like working, on something, <laughs> <laughs> working on something pretty interesting, Ellen. Well, you steam your clothes, right? So why not your plants? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to um, share a video about this kind of new piece of uh, equipment, a steam weeder that we've been working with uh, UK's physical plant division to test out here on campus. And of course, I'm approaching it from the perspective of how can I kill invasive plants? But the idea really being vegetation management in general, you know, there are a lot of weeds and in your landscape settings that we might want to get rid of and you know trying to increase the tools that are available for this and this is something that uh you know they use in different contexts in different ways and we wanted to test out in um kind of our campus landscape so i wanted to share that with you all all right let's check it out I'm Ellen Crocker, Forest Health Extension at the University of Kentucky. And I'm Lee Moser, a Water Quality Extension Associate here at the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food and Environment. We're here today to tell you a little bit about the Steam Weeder project that we've been working on for the past several years. The Steam Weeder is a new piece of equipment that we've been testing out in a variety of contexts to control vegetation. Um, there are lots of tools in that toolbox, but also a lot of need there in different contexts, whether it's managing invasive plants and getting rid of those to managing the weeds that pop up in your mulch beds. So the reason we're working with the steam weeder is because it's been identified as a potential alternative to traditional herbicide use in potentially sensitive areas like adjacent to streams and waterways or near storm drains or uh, impervious surfaces where it may be prone to run off. Whether we're talking about your garden, a landscape, or a natural area, there's lots of reasons that you might need to manage vegetation. There are invasive plants that come in, there are weeds that pop up, and it's important to have a big toolbox to deal with those different problems. Um, you can always use mechanical removal, pulling things up, there's chemical removal and effective treatments with herbicides, but we hope that the steam weeder could be another tool in that toolbox. Uh, might be a good fit for certain settings. The Steam Weeder Project was funded by a stormwater incentive grant provided by the Lexington Fayette Urban County Government. In addition to us, this grant was uh, first acquired by Dr. Carmen Agaritas at the University of Kentucky and Dr. Greg Munshaw. Um, they worked with UK's Physical Plant Division, Stacey Borden, Jerry Hart, and Richie Katko to conduct this work on campus. The staff at the Arboretum also played an important role in conducting the research. So you might be asking yourself, what exactly is a steam weeder? So a steam weeder is a device that uses a diesel burner and a pump to generate saturated steam. Uh, at the machine, it's running about 250 degrees Fahrenheit, and at the point of application, it's about 205 to 218 degrees Fahrenheit. And the idea is to basically scald or uh, steam the vegetation on site as an alternative to traditional pesticide that you might experience things like drift or potential runoff and contamination of local waterways. So steam weeding technology has been used in larger agricultural operations for some time and it's just now starting to become commercially available in a way that uh, can be mounted to a trailer and used in settings like here at the Arboretum. So we've been using it here at the Arboretum to try to test its potential for eradicating winter creeper. We've also been testing it uh, for its potential for collateral damage when you apply near ornamentals like uh, yews or lilies. 
So now Richie Catco is going to show us how to start up and operate the unit in the next video clip. This is our uh, this is our steam machine, um, the Weed Technics uh, steam generator. It uses a, a uses a diesel um, burner here to create steam, and then uses a gas pump to push steam through the hose and out the system. So it's got five fluids that we monitor. It's got water, of course, in the yellow tank in the back. Um, we've got two diesel tanks here that provide the, the fuel for the heat and the, burn, and the burner. And then we've got um, gasoline that runs a gas pump that pushes water through the system. And then we've got oil um, in both the um, diesel burner as well. So we have to monitor oil in the, in the gas engine. That's our five fluids. We've got controls to turn on the burner. We've got controls to change the pressure of the system. I've got controls to change the temperature of the burner. And I've got controls to operate the gas pump. Um, we've got a, uh, to deliver the steam, we've got a traditional sort of pressure washer nozzle or, or gun, if you will, with a trigger that controls steam delivery. Um, so one of the first things we do when we operate is we flush out the system from the last time we use it. Um, to do that, we would unspool the hose and we would turn on the gas pump and run the gas pump for about um, a few minutes. You see a change in the color of the water from a blue to back to clear. And that's when you know that the system is flushed. Once the system's flushed, the pump remains on and you would turn on the burner itself. Uh, once the burner is on, you wait a few moments and can look at the temperature gauge and watch the temperature rise. When we operate, our biggest concerns when we're operating are running out of gas in our water pump uh, and running out of water in our tank. We get about two hours of use out of a tank. If we run out of either gas or water, we run into a problem. We can't flush the burner with cool water to cool it down, right? We have to have cool water left over, so no matter what, we leave enough water, maybe 10 or 20 gallons of water, and we leave enough gas in our, in our, in our pump to be able to effectively flush the system every use. Um, so after we would cool the system down, um, we would spool the hose back up, remove the nozzle heads, and um, do a walk around, pull our cones, make sure we're ready to go. You know, that's, that's how we can operate in a day. After we do all of our safety walk arounds and checks, you know, we um, can un unspool our hose here, kind of keeping it protected. To unlock the unlock the spool. Start pulling some hose out. Try to minimize dragging the hose on the pavement or snagging the hose. Then we can turn the pump on and we flush the hose in a, in a safe place, maybe into the ditch or water a plant or something with, with the water. Got a typical gas pump here with a ignition, key ignition this time. We don't have to pull the the pull start at all, which is awesome. So one of the first things we'll do is we're gonna turn the fuel on. After checking the fuel level, of course, let's see how we do that. Good. Check the oil. We check the oil here. and then we can start the pump. So we've also got water, our water tank, and we, can, we have the water is turned on, which is important because we're trying to pump water. So we'll turn the gas on, and we'll notice we've got the engine choked, and then we'll turn the on switch after putting on hearing protection. Because it's loud.
So like anything, the steam weeder has some pros and cons that we should probably share with you. Some of the things that we noticed in our testing that we were surprised by, um, in a good way, was that first it was really effective. We tested it on winter creeper, which is a really challenging to manage invasive plant. It grows kind of over things as a carpet, it's woody, it has this really thick waxy cuticle on the leaf that makes it hard for it to uh, take up different uh, herbicides. But the steam weeder was really effective. In our tests, it was on par with another herbicide that we tested. And um, I think it would be really effective in certain settings on a wide range of weeds and other plants. Um, in addition, not only was it effective against winter creeper, but it didn't impact the plants that were directly next to it. So you can really limit your potential for non-target impacts. It's not going to damage the plants that are next to what you're trying to kill. So as for the downsides of the unit, there are a couple of major ones that we should probably identify. Uh, the first being the fact that it's probably cost restrictive for your average homeowner to purchase one of the units like what we have tested here on campus. Uh, this one ran about $12,000 and uh, this might be more appropriate for say a landscaping operation to use and it's an alternative service or in the context of a grounds department at a university or in a municipality. Uh, however, we didn't really find any units that were cost effective for a homeowner. Uh, hopefully that will change in the future, but at this point we haven't really identified any to share with you all. The other major challenge associated with the unit was the amount of time that it takes to control a plant such as winter creeper. Uh, in a stand like this where it's really dense and widely spread throughout a forested stand, uh, we were using uh, an application rate of about two to four seconds per linear foot of winter creeper with about a one foot wide applicator head on the steam weeder device. So if you do the math, that adds up to a lot of time in an area that may be more appropriate for an herbicide to control the plants that you're trying to remove. While some of our trials were here in this woodland setting, it's probably not the best use case for the steam weeder. Um, but nonetheless, I think they prove some of its potential benefits in a range of different landscape settings. Thanks for joining us today and learning a little bit more about the steam weeder and the University of Kentucky being a living learning laboratory for all sorts of research. If you want to learn more about managing invasive plants or other unwanted weeds in your landscape, make sure to reach out to your county agent. They're a great resource and you can also check out this link to learn more about the steam weeder in particular. Well, thank you, Ellen. We greatly appreciate that. And it looks like it could really do some damage on some winter creeper. <laughs> <laughs> so it did. And I was very skeptical of whether or not this would work. Um, you know, definitely always wanting to explore what's out there and, um, you know, put the latest and greatest tools in people's hands. Mm -hmm. But I was like, you know, winter creeper is tricky. And we selected it because it is so tricky uh, to manage. Um, and it worked really well. You can go to the UK Arboretum. Uh, if you go along the bike path, you'll see our plots with signage there. Uh, um, uh, but a couple notes about it. First off, as we mentioned, it's not really the, the use case for it. We just were testing that there, but you've got that big trailer, a big hose that needs to come in. I mean, you're not going to be able to get into the middle of your woods in that setting, but winter creeper is a problem in people's yards and landscape settings as well. Um, second, uh, you know, it's a foliar application. It fries that foliage. It smells like you're boiling cabbage uh, oh. when you're doing this, but it's not going to impact the roots at all or anything below ground. So some of those systemic herbicides are really a much better choice uh, if that's a major problem uh, versus some settings where if you can get the foliage, um, for example, I think the Richie Catco, who you saw in that video, um, he's been testing it a lot on campus and his favorite use is um, to expand kind of tree rings and then mulched beds uh, really easily kind of controls the weeds that are in there without impacting the tree or its roots. 
pretty cool work, Ellen. I mean, it's so important that we, you know, get some unbiased testing on some of these things as they come out. So I um, appreciate really? your all's work for sure. Um, yeah, It's been fun to test it out and it's been great working with UK's uh, PPD group, um, Richie, Stacy, uh, Jerry and others. And, um, you know, if this is something you're interested in learning more about, um, I encourage you to check it out. And, um, you know, I think, I think it, it does make sense in some contexts and could certainly be something we could see increased use of in the future. Yeah, and need all the tools we can get, that's for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Greatly appreciate you being on, Ellen. Yeah. Great, yeah. thanks for having me. Well, a lot of good information we've learned about today. Know. We was it lightning bugs or fireflies? You know, I guess it depends on our viewers where they're from. But right. uh, we're we're firmly in the lightning bug camp around here. Mm -hmm, definitely. Uh, yeah, and then hearing from Robert Bean and the service forester um, role that is so important here in Kentucky, especially to our audience uh, who care so much about woods and wildlife here in the state of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, what the Kentucky Division of Forestry does is invaluable. And then, as always, Dr. Ellen Crocker helping us kind of figure out what to do from a forest health perspective, um, keeping up with the latest and the greatest. So um, really good show. Thank you all for being with us today. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. And, you know, if you just want to go back and watch that video again, um, you can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and we will have um, that posted shortly. And to be honest, Billy, every episode we've had is on there. So you can binge watch us if you'd like. <laughs> no doubt. You know, if you want to learn all you can about woods and wildlife here in Kentucky, no better place to start than from the woods today. Definitely. All right. But that's all for today. We greatly appreciate you joining us and we will see you next week at 11. Take care. Bye. Bye. From the woods today